All right. You read me all right? I sure can, Fred. It's good to see you. Okay. All right. Is that a starship I see behind you? It is. It absolutely is. I, I got a, a 3D printed starship uh, that I ordered there because uh, I, 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 I mean, SpaceX is just doing fascinating things. So yeah. I grabbed one of these to be talking about. We were talking about like air resistance with um, how it's now having the the horizontal landing to uh -huh. reduce the terminal velocity and everything. So I, I had one to show. Yeah, that uh, amazing the number of engines they got in that sucker to get, uh, I think it's 18 million, 18 million pounds of thrust. And yet it's still not beating uh, Saturn V. Uh, oh yeah, it's a lot more than Saturn V, yeah. Yeah, there we go. Uh, Falcon Heavy, um, I think was temporarily beating it. And then the, what's the new Falcon Heavy? Because um, they changed the name of it. I can't think of what they changed the name to. Uh, but the, the, now that this thing's sitting on a stack, they changed the name and they'll be testing it later this year. But that's just fun space stuff because uh, I love it there. Um, shall I launch right into my, my questions and stuff? I want to respect your time. Okay, yeah. Uh, incidentally, you said you, you have a class. What are you teaching? I, I teach uh, high school physics. So I've, there's three, well, I teach three different levels of it right now. I teach uh, conceptual. It's, it, it's a lot of the math removed and looking purely at the concepts. And then I teach a, a middle level that's mostly for college bound seniors. Uh, and then I teach honors for those that are maybe going into a science. I've taught AP, but we're not running one level of AP for this year. So we, uh, the, the APs are across the hall this year, but I, I teach a variety of levels of, of okay. high school physics. All right, all right, interesting. Yeah, I had, um, go ahead. Yeah, I was going to say I had physics in college, but uh, they, they didn't have levels. It was just just physics. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, a lot of things have changed uh, since then. Well, I actually had one question about that. So I'd like to introduce you if I could, uh, sure. and then I'll, I'll ask my, my first question here. So I've got an introduction for you. Here we go. Okay. All right. Let's shoot. <laughs> you graduated from high school early and first did flight training in the Navy uh, before switching to fly fighter jets for the Marine Corps. A few years later, you were a tactical fighter pilot for the Air Force. Then after that, you became a NASA test pilot and were selected as part of the early astronaut program. You were part of the backup team for Apollo 8, 11, and 16, and you did a harrowing lap around the moon in Apollo 13 that took you further from Earth than any human has ever been. You worked on the space shuttle program with NASA and were the first to land a space shuttle as they were working on getting it ready for orbit. After more than 20 years with NASA, you retired and started working in the private sector with Grumman before they were Northrop Grumman. You oversaw countless projects there for almost 20 years, and now you spend a lot of time advocating for STEM education and space awareness, informing people largely through the Infinity Science Center in Mississippi and speaking at special engagements. Your list of additional medals and accolades is incredible, but I'll just mention three of them. You got the Presidential Medal of Freedom, NASA's Distinguished Service Medal, and NASA's Exceptional Service Medal. And you just wrote a book last month called Never Panic Early that I thoroughly enjoyed reading. Thank you so much for being here, Fred. It is, hey. it is our, our, our privilege to be able to hear from you. Um, how are you doing today? I'm doing fine. Uh, and it, that, what you read is just uh, kind of a re reflecting on a truly blessed and remarkable career I've been able to have. Uh, it, it is. And your book... I was just, uh, I was riveted. It was fascinating hearing about even the smaller details of your life. And that was uh, a privilege. So, um, excellent. So I've got, I've got five main questions for you uh, and a couple bonus round if, if you if we have time for them there, sure. but I'll, I'll jump right in. I just opened up by mentioning some of your credentials and your education. I know that you had to have quite a bit of general physics education. You mentioned even some of the orbital mechanics and things you were learning along the way in your book. Uh, and even just general flight stuff. I've had a few students that became pilots and they had to learn things like Bernoulli's principle or some basics relating to airflow and flight. But most of that was a few years ago at this point, a uh, couple of years ago. Uh, I'm just curious, what types of things stick out to you from your early education in physics, whether it was college, flight school? What, what are the things that stick out most to you? Well, I, th I think the things that stuck out, uh, the one course I had was uh, you know, basic leverage, uh, went into magnetism, I think, at that time. Uh, you know, th I'll call it everyday uh, applications uh, of how you see you see physics in action, but you don't realize it. So it's yeah, kind yeah. of an eye opener uh, that way. <clears throat> really, it, at that time, it really didn't. I'm trying to remember. I don't think it covered Bernoulli's theory. Or, 
or the sense of lift. I didn't think I got that till uh, aeronautics. Uh, but uh, no, it, it covered most of the things people don't think about uh, that they depend on really in some cases uh, and the way things work to depend on things to work uh, with physics. Excellent, thank you. Um, my second one here, this was maybe one of the things I was most delighted to read about in your book. And I just came in the next day talking to the teachers about it. And it was your geology world tours. Uh, when you were there with the original 19 and doing your geology world tours, uh, I know I personally enjoyed many national parks. I was at Sequoia and Kings Canyon uh, out in area where you spent some time, not that far from Lancaster. Uh, Antelope, was it, is it Lower Antelope Canyon or Valley? Antelope Valley. Antelope yeah, Valley. Yeah, I was driving right through that area two weeks ago. Uh, I was out in Death Valley uh, with my family too, just a couple weeks ago. Um, I visited a few crater sites myself and they're, they're, they're just fascinating. The crater sites on earth, uh, I absolutely love seeing Iceland and you visited Iceland on this trip. I still think it's one of the most magical destinations that both my wife and I ever spent time at. Uh, it's, it was fascinating, wonderful for me to hear how NASA wanted to provide astronauts with more hands-on geology experience prior to collecting moon rocks. Uh, I'm just curious though, throughout your geology world tours, because there were a couple of them, there were several times where they were taking you around the planet. Uh, which destinations to you felt the most alien? Uh, and are there any that you just have gone back to again and again because you loved them or that you really want to go back to again? Uh, well, I actually uh, had over the four missions uh, training, actually it wasn't much geology for Apollo 8. <laughs> Obviously, uh, we weren't going to land. But for the three missions I trained that would have landed on the moon, uh, I covered uh, 31 geology field trips. 31. Wow. And most were selected because of certain features uh, that you would find at that locale. And of course, most of them were in locales that there was not a lot of vegetation because you wanted mm -hmm. to be able to see the outcrops, uh, the rock, rock features. And so uh, one uh, we fir I first went to, in fact, was uh, in Aracope Mountains in California. And the, there was some sense of uh, volcanics to see there, but mostly it was to understand faulting because it lay right along the San Andreas Fault. So there had been that, that happening there a number of times. Others, we went to a uh, place in uh, Sudbury in uh, Canada that uh, would give you uh, the, the sense, because I was a big meteor hit there and actually opened up a mining industry because it exposed uh, nickel and I think uh, copper and uh, silver even in, in those mines that uh, came out of that big, huge meteorite impact. But they had shatter cones, they were called. A shatter cone is a feature that you see after a meteorite impact. And for some reason, whatever, the type of rock that hit in, it preserved a number of those features to observe. Uh, so the uh, obviously the features uh, in Hawaii served to look at basalty type rocks, rocks and two different uh, types of lava flows. The Aa hot flow, which was like a clunky, uh, uh, just a bunch of cinder, uh, cinder material slowly moving. And then you uh, had the Paha, whatever one was fast moving, almost like a river of hot rocks flowing. So you but you also got to look at some of the chemistry because they're very selective, more so I think in, in there than others. They had an abundance of olivine, this uh, nice green crystal that they used a lot in making jewelry even uh, and mm. a tourist uh, from those, uh, some of those lavas, but a lot of pyroxene and, and those that was quite pr uh, prevalent. Uh, we assembly, we started volcanology in Iceland, which is the basis of Iceland and uh, you know, briefly for G whiz, got to climb a little bit on the glacier and uh, went up to all the way, went all the way across the island and looked at the, where fissures had happened, where there was hot, uh, hot uh, ponds and uh, streams, much like in uh, Yosemite mm -hmm. is in the U.S. that were left there. And you could almost go down a stream and pick what temperature you wanted and uh, all the way to Ackery on the north uh, shore and just got to see a little little neat feature of what we have on earth where due to our tilt uh, at that time of year we were there the sun really never quite set yeah which was quite unusual but i'm saying most of these features were chosen uh some were ash flows uh, we went to in new mexico near four corners i think it was 
So it was an ash kind of flow rather than a lava flow, mm -hmm. different type of material. Uh, and of course, the, the premier, primer, primer course was at Grand Canyon mm. because it offers a nice layer cake exposure of a number of beds. And that gave me the uh, first feeling about what was uh, in geology was you have to think about lots of time. Now, I'd, I'd studied briefly. I'd studied astronomy just from the library books in high school, just uh, just uh, interest. And of course, uh, you you study a little bit about the universe, and you think of great distance and how big it is and how far apart things are. Uh, geology, though, I'd never been exposed to. And but you look at the Grand Canyon, and it takes you down through the layers from the top to bottom, covers a little over a billion years. Yeah. Uh, so, and, and they're, they're very prominently displayed. You can go down and, and see it. Also, a uh, picture of two limestone beds uh, within the one fairly large limestone bed told you that at two times that whole now arid, deserty looking area, it was underwater a considerable time to form those, because limestone only forms underwater. So, that was, uh, you know, another eye opener about how you, uh, and I thought about that and I say, well, if you lived long enough, thinking of how things change with time, uh, if you looked at the moon in a billion years or two billion years from now, the face we look at probably wouldn't look like it looks today. Right. Because it would have been impacted a lot more times and it would have changed the whole, the whole look. Uh, of course, I'm not going to get to wait around a million years, unfortunately, <laughs> but so somebody may hopefully will be here to get a look at that. Yeah, excellent. H have you gone back to any of those 31 locales or the places you visited again? Uh, I'm trying to think. No, not really. Uh, I'm sorry. I did get back to Iceland uh, after Apollo 13 on kind of a world tour. Yeah. But like most world tours, this was State Department uh, exercise. You don't have any spare time. They have all kinds of uh, public affairs and... Yeah. Uh, uh, private receptions and you know all all the showbiz uh, is what you're doing on those kind of uh, tours. Fair enough. They don't they don't book you too much leisure time for seeing the sites. Exactly. Yeah. Sorry to hear it. Um, I'll go on to my third question here. Thank you. This is brilliant. Um, I pursue astrophotography as a hobby. I've got a small telescope, a uh, monochromatic camera. I enjoy taking pictures of galaxies and nebulas. It's amazing what you can do with that. Uh, I also love shooting the Milky Way when I travel to dark sky sites. I can't imagine the views that you got out of the Odyssey, out of the lunar module when you were on Apollo 13. Now, you were trained to pilot by the stars a bit. Uh, so I I'm just curious, how would you describe your view of the stars while you were on the far side of the moon or anywhere just looking into the deep black? Or was it maybe, were you too distracted by the beautiful view staring back at the earth, looking at this part of the moon in a way that nobody else has looked at it before because you were higher up than others have been, or even just the stresses of the problems you were dealing with. Were you able to appreciate the stars? The star, no, the stars actually, uh, uh, if you were uh, out in the far west of Texas or somewhere way out in the, away from the lights, mm -hmm. uh, you would be able to see the stars better than we could see. Really? Is you it lost, because of the brightness? Because you lost uh, something from the... Uh, this windows, which had uh, the, the separation uh, uh, third stage and things squirted uh, stuff that got on the windows and you couldn't go out and wash your windows off. Oh, so You lost something that way. But secondly, uh, you're obviously, even though you're at the moon, you're not any closer to the stars effectively. Right, right. It's not very far, it's not very far away compared to the, even the nearest star. So you don't, you know, we'll not get any, uh, even if it, we didn't have the window problem, we would, they would not look any better than they would have been in West Texas somewhere, not in the middle of nowhere. Right. Yeah. I, I've been to Big Bend National Park in West Texas, beautiful stars out that way. I, I was just wondering if the difference in light pollution would be enough. Uh, so even there, there's still the Earth's atmosphere, the Earth's atmosphere really is restrictive in some ways, but I guess either from your dirty windows and you still had light of the moon and light of the sun, or sorry, light of the uh, earth and sometimes the sun that was impacting you. So I guess it didn't make it as dark as optimally, yeah. but I, I don't know this. I could have looked it up. When you were on the far side of the moon, 
what any idea what phase the moon was in? Because like, did you get to a place where you were far side of the moon and the sun was blocked out? Uh, well, it depends on the spacecraft attitude. Uh, yeah. Yeah, which way it was pointing. Uh, we had we had virtually a when we flew, we had a half moon and a half Earth. So virtually half the front side was lit, a little more than, and equivalently uh, the back side. So, so and we went around a little higher than most. We went around a little over 130 miles. Yeah. Double the altitude that the normal flights where they went into orbit. So we got a little broader view of the backside than uh, yeah. did before. But the, uh, the, the view is uh, one of the two, uh, it's really two two uh, dramatic things different flying for me flying in the space versus all my uh, aircraft experience was the uh, views uh even from earth orbit but certainly on the way drifting back and forth to the moon and then looking at the moon itself uh close up relatively close up and appreciating what a unfriendly looking place it is compared yeah. to earth which is colorized uh, in comparison, uh, the moon's much shades of sort of gray uh, features. And uh, whereas the earth is color, I mean, even from the moon, you can see the, the ocean sort of blue and uh, you can see continents, uh, land masses and cloud, even very large cloud patterns. Yeah. So, uh, the earth is a beautiful feature with a little halo around it. Uh, the sun's that through, look at the right angle which represents the total atmosphere and it isn't very thick. I mean, it isn't very, it's pretty thin uh, around that uh, beautiful earth. Yeah. The other, the other thing is zero gravity, of course, uh, being able to float around continuously. I've done a lot of zero gravity uh, when I was at NASA in my first uh, job, I was a research pilot at Lewis Research Center and we started the second zero G program in the country. Hmm. Uh, the Air Force had the first one. Uh, they were uh, t even then testing human subjects down at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base. And we started one at Lewis more to test fluid systems. Hmm. We were testing the uh, cooling cycle for the SNAP-8 nuclear power generated flew on some satellites, uh, defining the tank tankage and the screen locations, uh, et cetera, for the Centaur rocket, mm -hmm. uh, which flew later. And using an AJ-2 aircraft, and uh, just uh, the way we had to fly that airplane and uh, not bury the trim as we went through the trajectory and up over the top and the pull out and et cetera, you had to do a lot of uh, handling the force, the forces. You couldn't trim them out. Uh, that would disturb the, the trajectory. And so you got tired, and so we normally flew two pilots. And the pilot that wasn't flying uh, would go into Bombay and actually help recenter packages that were particularly ones we were free floating. Huh. So you you were your duty was in the Bombay, and we did create an artificial wall up toward the cabin that you could go hide behind. So <laughs> the packages got loose, or they started drifting forward. You could you could be hidden behind that wall. Uh, and even then, we had some heavier packages that uh, we had to have a hoist and the uh, to lift it back up and put it in position it was pretty heavy because we had a it was we're flying liquid hydrogen so we had a like a bomb proof a shell around it so it was up around a couple of hundred pounds hmm. so when it would end up to run it might be at one at one or the other end of the payload bay so you'd have to hook up an electric hoist and put it position it back to the center uh some we had uh, like the, the snap eight nuclear power uh, cooling cycle that was a strap down rig uh, it did not free float so but uh, you got some you got a lot of zero to g time which you didn't really appreciate because you weren't doing it to be floating around you were doing it for the experiments that were right. in, in the payload bay yeah i i just found on i was looking around for some stuff i found the original recording you did uh in 1970 uh, where you're doing the lunar module tour uh so that's there on YouTube. It's like a 32 minutes long or something where you've got the camera for maybe half the time. And I think Jim Lovell has the camera uh, and has you just given the tour of the lunar module and around there. Uh, and in that, is it you, I think, that's doing the somersaults uh, in zero G while he's got the camera? Uh, that might be it. Uh, you must be talking about a TV show. Yes, yes. The, the recording that you did for TV. Yes, we did. We did it in the lunar module because we knew we were, you know, this was a plan 
thing. Right. And we had uh, reviewed uh, previous flights, uh, their TV shows. All the flights had several of these scheduled. And we were, going to, we were trying to figure out what we could do that was different. It had not been yeah. shown before. And it appeared most of the uh, things we uh, could show, show and tell with, would be in the lunar module with certain new, and some new things had been added. So that was our show. Was to, and I had to pull out equipment that was in storage to do that uh, and uh, hold, hold it and talk about it. And I maybe have done that uh, tumble sort, as you say, for showbiz. But uh, that was just before the explosion. Right. Like you I, was said, still, I, was still, I was still putting things away when that happened that I had pulled out. Jim had already started drifting up to the uh, mothership. And uh, so anyway, that was just before that uh, things got busy. Yeah. And I think you said, or I saw somewhere else that it was supposed to be you that would have stirred the tanks, but you were busy storing stuff away. So it wasn't, I mean, it wasn't, nobody blamed That's Jack right. Swaggart for yeah, the that switch. there. It was just what had happened. Yeah, the switches were in front of the occupant who would normally be in the right couch, which would have been me had I been in my normal position. So I would have been the one that followed the instructions and stirred the cryo. Right. So, I, you know, the movie made a thing of it that uh, Jack did something bad by not looking at something. There's nothing for, for electric short. There's nothing you can look at ahead of time. Until right. It happens. Yeah. Right. Excellent. Um, I'll go on to my fourth official question here. Uh, your involvement with the Infinity Science Center is evidence of your interest in furthering future generations' knowledge and understanding of math and science. You also mentioned this in your book, and you mentioned it in your segment with the Planetary Society podcast just recently. I'm curious, what do you perceive as our biggest deficit when it comes to math or science in the U.S. right now, or where would you most like us to, uh, to see us improve? Well, I, I don't think it's unique to uh, Infinity. It's I, 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 not, I don't just work with Infinity. I do fundraising type events with uh, aviation and science uh, and space uh, museums around the country. Um, I think they're, they're important because uh, those museums offer uh, the kind of picture of things or, or hands-on, in some cases, uh, exhibits that are, to the children uh, at least, are, are exciting and can trigger something in their imagination that says, well, this is, looks like something that'd be fun to do. And hopefully if they have the, uh, they're blessed to be born with the right aptitude and uh, skills, they would uh, choose to employ them in their future career. So that's a, I look at museums as offering, and particularly modern ones like Infinity, most of ours are, a lot of them are interactive. Mm -hmm. you know, it's a, a lot of the hands-on at the exhibits, children, younger children like, maybe you even, uh, <laughs> you're younger. Uh, and I call it stealth learning because they, they'll spend a lot of time uh, there just for that reason. And so they, they learn something without realizing they're learning something. So that's why I call it stealth learning. I like and, that. Uh, so, I, but uh, I got involved with uh, Infinity, uh, so sort of little uh, backwards, uh, I'd been six years on the Astronaut Memorial Foundation, mm -hmm. which has responsibility for the Space Mirror at Kennedy Space Center that uh, expresses names of astronauts who have died in line of duty, and also has a building there the, at the Kennedy Space Center, Center for Space Education, which NASA uses part of it as well. But again, it's for, again, mo mostly uh, teachers, science and math teachers, but also for teachers who, uh, for whatever reason, have become the IT expert for the school. So there's a, a lab set up even where they can uh, wire net, learn the wire network and uh, do some uh, call it rudimentary repairs on computing equipment and uh, that kind of thing. Because the schools, uh, uh, unfortunately, often can't afford a true IT expert uh, salary-wise. So the, the teacher that has that aptitude becomes that expert for the school. So it, part of that's in the space education. But at any rate, I, I was planning, at the six years, I was planning on retiring because I'd already retired from Northrop Grumman at the time. And a uh, fellow, uh, Leo Seal, who was head of the largest bank in uh, South Mississippi, uh, called me to come in and he was going to talk to me about a project. And the project was to develop the Infinity Science Center. Hmm. Mississippi, 
which would be adjacent to uh, the same exit off Interstate 10 as Stennis Space Center. Now he, he got into it more because his dad had been one of those instrumental when they formed uh, the original Stennis, which was Mississippi Test Facility for rocket testing. Uh, his dad was very involved in talking several of the people in small towns to leave their towns. Mm. See, they closed three, ta three towns for uh, the space acreage needed for uh, the Mississippi Test Facility, which is now Stennis in that buffer zone. Uh, people are still allowed to visit cemeteries that may have been left but the towns are gone and three of them they closed and uh so we we uh he, he had see got roped into that from his dad's uh work and what he'd done earlier on to help out because 9 11 had pretty well shut down the small infinity uh small museum they had out at stennis space center because people couldn't just leisurely drive through the gates anymore oh. And so uh, they, they gave us, uh, us a not-for-profit 18 acres under a 30-year land use agreement. Mm -hmm. And we now had the obligation to, uh, with the initial goal of raising $40 million to build it. And, oper and we operate it. It does serve as a NASA a visitor center, as an aside, but uh, we, we are not-for-profit really have built it and uh, now operate it. So that was the thing I joined, and I was thinking of it more from the uh, aspect of what I mentioned, what it would do for children and where I grew up in South Mississippi at Biloxi, because there's no set, there's no thing comparable to that. I don't think comparable even in New Orleans. Mm. Uh, so that was my interest in, uh, in being part of, part of the project and helping to raise the funds and uh, get it built. Very cool. Thank you. Um, my my last official question for you here, and then we'll see if I can do a couple fast ones. Uh, I was so pleased to hear of your passion for educating others on the threat of asteroids and potential collisions with the Earth in the future. Uh, we have made such great leaps in this territory in the past 10 years, especially, but we still have so far to go. Uh, curious, which ideas or missions maybe are you most looking forward to regarding protecting our planet from potential collisions in the future or which ones would you still like to see get off the ground? Well, let, uh, we've had, as you mentioned, a number of missions. Some have uh, landed. Mm -hmm. uh, we, we landed one, I think, collected a sample, although it's still on its way back. I'm not yeah. sure what year it's going to land. This year, I think. We had, uh, I think a European space agency had one that offset pretty close to and shot pictures of a comet. Mm -hmm. uh, the one that's en route now, the, near, the closest, uh, nearest was called, I think it's called Near. Uh, was launched uh, several months ago. Uh, is it DART? Double Asteroid Redirection Test? Right, yeah, the redirection test. Uh, and it's, uh, will take, unfortunately, these things take a long while to get there. They're not the answer to uh, thwart and, uh, and, and protect against the meteorite, but, but eventually they run trajectories that take a long while, but it's going to get there and it's going to hit uh, get close to a meteorite that is large enough to have had, has a satellite. And so again, and uh, from the, your standpoint, it ought to be interesting because they're going to nudge it uh, with a certain amount of momentum and understand the physics of the change of the trajectory uh, to understand how best uh, if they can scale it up uh, for different uh, masses of meteorites, how we might send a rocket that would similarly nudge uh, it in a certain direction to change its path so it doesn't hit Earth. It's kind of scary because, uh, you know, we're mapping now uh, to, to a pretty small level of meteorites and uh, comets with uh, other space missions that are up there for observation that we've gotten, gotten up uh, uh, to get even a smaller, I forget what size they can go. The next the one that's going up now can get to a smaller size than they could before. But uh, we now have seen several, at least two, I think, of the so-called interlopers. Yeah. In other words, they're things that come from outside the solar system. So you're not going to know they're here, and you're the bullseye till they're here. Yeah. So, uh, we, we need to maybe think about having a, a crisper answer to react to and more, and I call it a more direct rendezvous basis to actually thwart uh, an impact sometime in the future. 
right it should be of interest uh, internationally because uh if it hits a big enough one hits it's going to affect us all yeah uh the whole earth now rusty Schweiger, that's i wrote that in my book rusty Schweigert uh worked hard at uh getting govern our government uh, awareness of that possibility to do more work earlier on he, i think he went to congress testify at least once and he with another astronaut created a website that's active today uh so at any rate that uh that's still ongoing, like most governments, uh, I think, uh, of any type, they normally uh, are reactive rather than proactive. And so I'm, I'm afraid the Earth may have to suffer, hopefully, a smaller meteorite impact to really uh, induce significant da damage to open the eyes, really, that we ought to be serious about having a uh, defense system. Yeah. And I think that's what happened uh, 11 years ago or whatever, when the Chelyabinsk meteor was over that Siberian region of Russia. Uh, that was almost, you look at the funding that we were putting towards space defense. And then the next year after that, we had a major jumps in funding. We we're like, oh, right, this is a big problem. Yes. Uh, right. so, yep. Yeah. Uh, excellent. This is wonderful. Um, one tiny piece that I just want to make sure I said appropriately. Were, did I say correctly, were you the first person to land a space shuttle effectively? Uh, the first, yes, with Enterprise. We flew yeah. the approach and landing test where we used, uh, run the rocket, we used the 747 to get us up to a reasonable altitude that we could uh, separate and even without engines through a glide profile, do some flight tests, uh, prim primarily trying to verify the uh, aerodynamics, subsonic aerodynamics of the vehicle. And uh, always a bugaboo on a, any first vehicle is what is ground effect gonna be like? This mm -hmm. is the, uh, when you near the ground, if you think of an airplane at 90 degrees angle, it's like the, uh, the height of the, the wing, the width of the wing above the ground. That's where you start encountering ground effect, which can be a cushioning factor or depending on the airfoil, uh, and, and body shape can be actually almost like a suck you into the ground a little bit. Uh, and the Concorde is that way, incidentally. Uh, they have pilots have to head of head to overcompensate a little bit of pitch, be prepared as to, to not have too hard a land, not dangerously, but passengers don't like hard landings. No. So they worked at softening it. And uh, so that was the other thing we could, uh, for, you could only find out what it was by flying the vehicle. Uh, we also did, uh, uh, I call it a, a couple of other factors with the program. Uh, we did uh, ring out the four set sync computer uh, system that we had a lot of problems with getting it to work. In fact, we were down to one software load or two without, without from IBM to about give up that we couldn't make it work. This computers kept voting each other out. Mm, yeah. So we were about to go down to just a single string one string primary and one string backup and go fly approach and landing test. But we finally uh, did get the uh, software to work uh, just before we moved it, in fact, to uh, Edwards uh, from Palmdale. Uh, the other thing was more programmatic and what I think the program served. Uh, we ended up with a large gap where we flew the last Apollo mission and when we were gonna fly the first orbital mission. In fact, uh, it was announced as we were approaching uh, the, those first uh, tests with Enterprise that there was a, a, at least a two year slip in the first orbital flight, which is not a, it's a sort of a negative thing. You didn't like out there hanging at the same time. We were changing the administrations. A new president had come in in January, uh, President Carter. And you always worry about that with a new president thinks it's not his program. It was started in that case by Nixon, the previous president. And you wonder about uh, the continued, at least some continued administration support for the program. It's always a concern. So this look, uh, seemed to me to be a good gap filler to at least have some good, hopefully good public exposure about the program, ultimately the larger program that was gonna come about, uh, although a few years later than originally planned. So program programmatically, it was a good thing to do. Yeah.
Um, I've got a couple quick ones for you, just uh, fast answers here for this. Um, and it, it's even relevant since you were flying the Enterprise shuttle and today is May the 4th, Star Wars or Star Trek for you? I'm sorry? Star Wars or Star Trek? Do you have a preference in those two genres? Oh, the name? I would... or, no, just in general. Are you a Star Wars fan or a Star Trek fan or neither? Uh, I'm sort of both. Uh, I can, I can, because because both of them are, I'll say, quite a bit fictionalized. Right, right, right. Even though they have some, I call it absurd, absurd capabilities uh, demonstrated, uh, physics even. Right, right. Uh, I can, uh, I can accept it. Uh, what, what bothers me more is a what what, what you'd call a Hollywood movie that is not a documentary and does some absurd things that defies mm -hmm. physics or orbital mechanics or whatever, uh, th those give me a harder time to appreciate. Right, right. Uh, that makes sense. When, when they, they pretend like it's a reality, like that, that the moon's about to collide with the earth or that something else is going to happen right. there, as opposed to something where you walk into it and think, this is sci-fi. I know this is fiction. Right. They're just having fun. Yeah, like I, I accept walk drive. Yeah, I wish we had it, but... <laughs> <laughs> Uh, excellent. Uh, my computer just gave a, a, a something. Do, is my audio still good? What's that? Does my audio still work? My computer just had a notification pop. Oh, I see you. I mean, I can hear you too. Yeah. Perfect. Good. Yeah. Um, okay. Uh, this is a fun one. Maybe you've been asked before. I don't know. I couldn't find it. Apollo 13 traveled further from Earth than any other mission. Who do you think technically got the furthest from the Earth? You, Jim Lovell, Jack Swagger. I know your, your spaceship is, is rotating a bit. But did you guys ever have a claim of one of you might have been in a further part of the spaceship? Uh, no, I, I have I have not claimed. Uh, I, it would depend on uh, the attitude of the vehicle and our, where we would happen to be sitting because we, Jack and I, were moving around windows to all windows to shoot the better shots we thought of the moon. Mm -hmm. uh, Jim didn't do much shooting because he was he was really had seen the moon quite a bit before on eight mm -hmm. in number number of orbits. And I uh, was obviously sorely disappointed because this was second trip and he wasn't going to get the land. Yeah. So Jack and I did most of the photo uh, ops around around the moon. Um, no, I have no idea. And obviously, it's a uh, the reason we were further, uh, so called further, from a record standpoint was just where where the moon was in its orbit at the time we went, which made it a little further. And secondly, we uh, went around it at, a, like I said, a higher, double uh, normal altitude of the normal uh, lunar mission, which went in at about 60 miles. And we coasted around at about 131 point something miles. Yeah. So it's a, it's a gee whiz that I just soon have landed and not have the record, frankly. Yeah, I, I hear you there. You would have been sixth person to set foot on the moon. I know that's, that's uh, a, right. uh, yeah. Uh, another quick one for you. Has there ever been a pitch for a movie based on the original 19? Your stories of that that batch just were fascinating, wild. They were so much fun. <laughs> it feels like you could make a, a series or something out of it. Has there ever been any pitch you're aware of? No, I've, no, I've never heard of anything even uh, documentary-wise for that, no. It, it sounds like it should happen. Uh, uh, that, that's, uh, that sounds like a lot of fun. Uh, another quick one here. You grew up, well, not grew up, your early... Um, NASA and flight career included several flight simulators. Uh, our, our, I, I wanted to say archaic uh, as far as how they were. Like the flight simulators of then, even when my students were watching Apollo 13, one's asking, why do they have the cameras and the mirrors with this or that? Flight simulators have come an incredibly long way in the past 60 years as far as what a flight simulator looks like now. I'm just curious uh, to just scratch that old itch or anything. Have you ever fired up a recent flight simulator? No, uh, you're talking about a modern flight simulator. Yeah. yeah. No, I've not. No, I've not flown. Obviously, you're right. The, the biggest, actually, the biggest uh, thing I think they have gotten better is visuals. Mm -hmm. Visuals plus uh, matching the visuals with uh, moving base, uh, so you get some. Uh, I'm talking about like fighters now. I know that uh, you can get into a simulator, and they can even pick which fighter you go against in air combat maneuvering and. Uh, and give the other the other airplane uh, characteristics that the real one would have, and so you can do dogfighting, for instance, yeah. uh, in, in a visual. See, our visuals were pretty poor. Uh, in the command module, we had uh, you could you could see an Earth horizon, 
you can see obviously a very accurate star field uh, because we had to do star sightings, the so-called land the platform, that kind of thing. Uh, the, the lunar module uh, was not bad for the site you're going to land at. They actually built a big plaster Paris uh, cast of the landing site that you were now descending into the land. But when you got down to around 2,000 feet on down, uh, the detail just wasn't there mm. of the real. And that's obviously why all the landings uh, that were made were done manually. Mm -hmm. Because when they got down that low, what, what the... Now they saw features, rocks are of a certain size or whatever that were not good to land by. And so they moved some, some cases not very far, but had to deviate a little bit and the pick in the spot they actually touched down. Uh, so you, don't, you didn't have that clarity right near touchdown with the visuals and the limb. Although from a, from a higher up view, it looked the, la the landing site as best the photography was available provided that and that the uh, parents plaster product cast that was uh, built now Lovell I think had one he stole one once so that stole it borrowed it <laughs> from uh, I think it was Apollo 17 site actually he had it in the restaurant he had in Chicago that's funny yeah and down in a yeah had it mounted on the wall that's pretty funny yeah one last movie question here and then a uh, separate one uh so two to go this one, when I was watching that footage, I was watching the original footage that you did for the TV broadcast that they didn't air at the time, uh, but that that footage there. Um, and I went looking for something because in the movie, they portray you as having played uh, Norman Greenbaum's Spirit in the Sky as opposed to the um, 2001 A Space Odyssey. But yeah. I couldn't find anything like that in the broadcast. Did they just make that up? No, I, I'm sure they made it up. The whole music thing, I thought... I well, first of all, I had nothing to do with the music that we did have some recorded music uh, and I had nothing to do with what music was chosen or how, what was put on that Sony uh, tape recorder. But no, I don't think nothing, nothing in particular was even playing at the time when we did the broadcast. The audio, it's in the last two minutes of it. And the audio, I mean, it's, it's very, I don't know, it's 8-bit audio or something. And you can only make out a few notes, but... Uh, Jim does mention that this is 2001, a theme from 2001, A Space Odyssey, in honor of you being in the Odyssey. They had that put on the uh, Sony tape recorder, and he was playing it, I guess. You know? Yeah. Uh, you mentioned that that was some of your entertainment up there, the tape recorder with that. Uh, yeah, but I, I was not involved with any of those incidentals of the music. I had nothing to do with the patch design. Uh, Jim worked that with a, a professional. Unusually, ours, I think, was the only one done by a professional uh, painter and sculpture Lumen Winters in New York. We had done, I think, sculpture at the New York uh, Museum of Art and New Rochelle uh, Museum of Art with using marble to carve that he had gotten from the same mountain in Italy that Michelangelo had used. Wow. And he, uh, I think he did the big painting uh, mural on the wall in the uh, UN, the United Nations, that big wall uh, mural. So uh, Lumen Winters was the guy who uh, Jim somehow met. I don't even know how he met Lumen and talked him into doing our uh, patch. Mm. That's cool. Um, those patches are always fascinating. Um, my, my last one of this one here, I've, I've read a few good books set in the time period of the Apollo mission that were recently written, past couple of years. Uh, the, the Apollo Murders was one by Chris Hadfield, just came out in the last few years. Chris Hadfield, Canadian astronaut, uh, yeah. Spent a lot of time on the International Space Station. Yeah, just wrote a, a fiction book called The Apollo Murders. Uh, fascinating. Uh, another one called The Calculating Stars by Mary Robinette Kowal, uh, where it's set, it actually starts in the 50s. And there's an event that really gets the world to unite and work on the space program in a little bit more accelerated fashion. I'm just curious, have you read any books that accurately felt like portrayed the Apollo era or uh, that you'd uh, recommend for space books besides the excellent Never Panic Early uh, that I, I would recommend to anyone there. No, I know I'm not. Neither of those I've heard of them, but I have not read them. Uh, I'm kind of behind, uh, as you can see. In fact, I've uh, I'm still uh, got about a quarter to go of Eileen Collins' uh, book. Eileen was the first uh, commander of the shuttle. Mm. And I'm about through with her book, but I, I've gotten this book. Mm. Uh, 
that it's, I've not gotten into it yet, but it's by Ron Evans, Long Voyage to the Moon. And then this one is Frank Borman, uh, Far Side huh. of the Moon. This is a new one that's recently out. I have, look I have those two I uh, purchased to, to read at some point. Um, what, I'm, what I'm really tied up right now with uh, spending a lot of time is I'm creating a website. Mm. Uh, the uh, Never Panic Early, uh, as we went through the editing process, probably, uh, I, I, don't, I have never measured it exactly. Probably about 30 pages were deleted mm. through the editing process. And uh, I'd have to agree some of it was, uh, you might uh, discount in terms of trivia or of a complexity that the uh, average person wouldn't appreciate. Uh, so mm -hmm. it was more than a guy. So what I've done is I've created a website that's not gonna mirror the book exactly, but it's gonna kind of cover stages and I'll, I've organi organized it. So I'll have a narrative that will be quite lengthy to, to introduce each section. Like oh, cool. I call it growing up. Yeah. Uh, like the early part of my life. And then I'll add to it pictures, because again, when you when you publish a book, you're limited how many pictures you can have. Right. So now I'll have a picture section, and then I'll have an archival section. Now, unfortunately, my uh, growing up period won't have a lot of archival stuff, but uh, like you get to, uh, I got a whole uh, list of growing up uh, military experience back to school, NASA research pilot days, astronaut adventures, aerospace executive days, rock and chair years, and, well, I'm, and have brain blurbs. Brain, brain blurbs are gonna be just where thoughts, like when you get older, things all at once will pop into your head from 40 years ago. <laughs> and so there'll be those that will go in the brain blurbs. So to kind of keep that, the site active. Excellent, do you already have a domain for this website? I have I got a domain I've uh, uh, paid for 10 years and it's actually uh, a new domain uh, uh, called space not dot com but dot space oh cool yeah and I've also signed up for five years of the service to uh, keep it active although it's not active yet uh, I think um, I'm uh, working with a fellow that's helped me design it will probably We'll probably go active with something that uh, just that uh, I'm working hard on uh, completing the astronaut adventure section, which obviously will be the fullest. Mm -hmm. It'll have uh, tons of pictures mm -hmm. and a lot of archival mm -hmm. data. Awesome. Uh, so that that will be completed first. And we, we may put something out and go active with that to say with more more what they explain a little bit what, what's coming. So, yeah, yeah, but it was it was thought to both amplify a little bit the book, but more so to provide uh, the kind of data I would have ne never presented in the book anyway. But for a space hipster, uh, a person that's really interested in space, they they might uh, if they getting need something to help them go to sleep, they might want to <laughs> cruise through, through some of that to see because uh, I have a diary, like I have a diary of. Literally uh, 14 months, I was testing one of the modules. Mm. Another diary of four years, I was in the Orbiter Project Office. So, you know, I got that kind of stuff that'll be in the archives. Sounds great. If, if you could, in the book, you might have them as appendices. Right. But uh, also, when you work with a publisher, they somewhat limit pages. Yeah. And, and pictures, obviously. Excellent. Well, I'll go ahead and of those... I think you might have a lot of fun with the Apollo murders. It's fiction, but it's written by a guy who spent oh, yeah. hundreds of days in space. I, know, I, know, I never met him, but I know who you're talking about. He was very entertaining on his time on space station. Yeah, exactly, exactly. And yep. it's it's set. I, I won't spoil it, but basically, it's set as if Apollo 18, although it was canceled, did happen, but was military run. Um, mm -hmm. And it was military run regarding some Cold War stuff, trying to stop Russia from doing something. But there's so many true facts in it. You'll, you'd appreciate that. It's not like, oh, here's fiction. 
they're actually tr talking about a Russian spy satellite of the time that they were trying to work against. Uh, Gene Krantz is a character in it. Deke Slayton's a character in it. Like they have a lot of people who would have been there that are characters in this okay. uh, fictional retelling of, of a way there by somebody who appreciates space and he's uh, okay. and very experienced on his own. So I think you'd you'd, you'd probably get some smiles right. out of it. Especially since you do a lot of it. Uh, add that to my book pile that I've been read. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, I have a handful of student questions in front of me, but most of them I think I can answer because they're things that you answered in your book. Uh, but I'll ask one real quick one here. One student wanted to know, did you ever play any pranks or jokes on the fel your fellow astronauts in space? Practical jokes? Or any, any sort of pranks or anything, yeah. No, I did not. Uh, Jim thought I had <laughs> mentioned it. In fact, that when he talks about it, he talks about when the explosion happened, he thought I had switched the valve in the limb environmental system, which does make a banging kind of sound, but he should have known. And I knew, of course, immediately I hadn't done it, but the other, other things that were happening told you clearly that wasn't it because we had some vehicle motion that came with that big panel coming off. And we had a lot of the hundred pound thrusters firing mm. uh, to try to hold trying to hold a vehicle attitude from the motion that had been imparted by the explosion. So there was a lot of things going on that would, was more than would have happened if I just thrown the valve. Yeah. I think Jim was hopefully thinking and hoping that that's what I had done. <laughs> that was all I was to it. <laughs> and I tricked him and threw that valve again to wake him up a little bit. But yeah. no, that wasn't the case. Excellent. Well, Fred, I, I appreciate this. This has been uh, such a, a, a treat and a pleasure uh, for it there. Um, do you prefer Fred or Fredo? Doesn't matter. Yeah. <laughs> um, it's off of the book. Um, in my hometown, they call me Pecky. You had a lot of nicknames, a uh, variety of nicknames throughout there. And, and all my family, people. family called me Pecky. Yeah. <laughs> well, it, it is, it's been a pleasure. Uh, I, I really appreciate you taking the time for this. Uh, if I make it out to uh, Mississippi, I encourage, uh, I'm very encouraged by what you've said about the Infinity Science Center. I'd love to check it out. Great. Um, and when you have your website launched. I'll certainly uh, be checking that out myself and looking toward it there. Uh, do you know what, what domain we should be looking for? Something.space, is it neverpanicearly.space? What's that? Will it be neverpanicearly.space or uh, have you released what the website will be? Oh, the, web, the website will be uh, www.fredhaze.space. Perfect, fredhaze.space. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I will not find anything if you went there now. It's not, right. not active, yeah, All right. Excellent. Well, I will look forward to checking you, that out. Well, if you follow, uh, obviously you're a space hipster, <laughs> so you, you know, I'll, I'll let Lois Honeycutt know when it's live, so you'll, you'll probably see a notice on uh, space hipster. Perfect. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you again. I, I greatly appreciate it. There, uh, fascinating. In fact, uh, are you tied in tonight for the space hipster Zoom tonight? I don't know about any space hipster Zooms tonight. Yeah, there's a space hipster Zoom thing. I'm going I'm to hook up briefly at, uh, I think, 7.30. Let's see. Yeah, I'm supposed to hook up at 7.30. I think it starts at 7. It's one where they have a contest of trivia, and they have awards, and I've donated some things that are going to be given out to certain to winners. Jackson Very cool. Donated something. Uh, anyway, they have a number of things like that. It's a party kind of a thing. Yeah, that sounds great. Yeah. So anyway, it uh, starts at seven tonight. And I think it, they charge you admission because they're trying to get money for those uh, young ladies, uh, Indian ladies that the, they sponsored last year through Space Camp. OK, so that's the primary side effect of uh, benefit of the event uh, tonight. Cool. Very cool. Well, yeah. enjoy that. That sounds like a great time. Yeah. All right. <laughs> Well, have a great afternoon. Thank you again, and uh, good luck to you. Well, good luck to you. Uh, I appreciate your sacrifice and getting us some future uh, people to help with some of the problems we face in the head. Thank and, you. Because uh, we're going to need some very smart people, I think. I think so, too. Yeah, all um, right. All right. Take care. Have a great day. Thank you again. Bye-bye. Right. Bye. -bye. Bye.